If I was a waiter, okay. I would just be like a, a clown being a waiter, right? If I was a banker, <laughs> I'd just be a clown Are you being a, a clown banker. giving an interview right now? Yeah. You're listening to The Artist Athlete, episode 30. This podcast is dedicated to circus. It's a place for professionals to share their stories, viewpoints, and information, and a place for outsiders to get a sneak peek into the industry. Hey, friends, fans, and enemies, I'm Shannon McKenna, and I'm the host of the Artist Athlete Podcast and the founder of theartistathlete.com. The Artist Athlete Podcast exists because of people all over the globe, who give small monthly amounts of money to help me produce the show. I produce it entirely by myself, so I ha- I shoulder all the expenses. Um, I pay an editor to master the sound of each episode. I have someone who distributes each episode across five platforms. I pay for all the gear, a monthly hosting service, and all of these expenses average out to about $500 a month. Right now, Patreons give about $400 a month, which means we are so close to making that first goal of making the podcast self-sufficient, but we need your help. Whether you listen every week or you're binge listening to all the episodes at once, you crazy, crazy cat you, please, please, please go to patreon.com slash theartistathlete. You can give as little as a dollar and every single one goes back into improving the podcast. If you give $30 a month, I will personally call you up and do a mini interview with you at the beginning of a show. Go to patreon.com slash the artist athlete. My guest today is Joel Baker. A cross-country motorcycle trip landed Joel in San Francisco, where he discovered and fell in love with circus arts. He joined the newly created Clown Conservatory at the San Francisco Circus Center. Joel launched his career as an acrobatic clown in San Francisco's New Pickles Circus, directed by Gypsy Snyder. Joel was featured in Loft by by the Seven Fingers and in Soap at the Chameleon Theater in Berlin. He performed and served as artistic coach in the Cirque du Soleil show, The Beatles' Love. He was featured in Cirque Oasis' Circopolis, and he is a regular performer in the Palazzo Varieté shows throughout Germany and Austria. Joel has appeared on television in NBC's America's Got Talent, ABC's The View, and was featured in James Cameron's film Cirque du Soleil, Worlds Away. Now, I have to warn you in advance, Joel and I sat in the hallway at the San Francisco Circus Center and talked for a good two hours. So this interview is definitely a two-parter. The next half will be released next week. Joel has so many amazing stories, and it was hard to cut this episode. So if you're a Patreon giving $5 or more a month, the entire two-hour uncut episode is available to you on the Patreon website. Again, it's patreon.com slash theartistathlete. For those of you that aren't Patreons, you'll just have to always wonder which of Joel's clever insights and my bad jokes didn't make the cut. Here's part one of my interview with Joel Baker. I am Joel Baker. I am um, a clown and an acrobat. I'm also a director and a coach for clowns, uh, for circus artists. I help people develop ideas that they have in circus. And um, I direct shows for Circus Bella. And I'm the assistant director of a show in Italy. It's like an Italian version of Alice in Wonderland. Is the Italian version of Alice in Wonderland different? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's completely different. You won't even see Alice in Wonderland. There's no music. rabbit. No, there's no rabbit. I kind of play the rabbit in the show as well because oh, cool. I'm in the show too. Oh, nice. But um, What's it like to direct a show that you're also in? Well, I'm not really directing it. I'm just the assistant. Oh, okay. Of that show. So I bring people coffee. Yeah. I bring the director coffee. Right on. And I bring ideas to the show. What a fun job to have. It's Well, yeah. Hey, circus is a good life, right? It's not a bad one. <laughs> I'm not mad at it. All right. So let's, uh, I like to do these interviews kind of like start at the beginning. 
go through the process. Oh, the beginning. The beginning. That's All right. So I place. was, um, as a very uh, a fastidious researcher, yes. I was reading about you Ooh. on my iPhone on the train today. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I think you've done more research about the podcast than I have about you. <laughs> but I did read that you started on a motorcycle trip. California? Y yes. I was, before I did circus, I was a barber and a biker. I was a barber in Tallahassee, Florida. I'm from the South, like you. Hey. And I think it all started with um, me getting cancer, right? I had cancer and I had a, I had a tumor Whoa. in my body. So I got rid of the tumor and I had chemo and I went through a lot of that you, the things you go through yeah. after cancer. Soon after, my mother got cancer. And I think it was maybe like a couple of months after I recovered, right? And she got cancer, liver cancer. She died of cancer. After that, I was hanging out with a best friend of mine, my friend Todd Space, and we were- Todd's last name is Space. Yeah, That's Todd Space. That's a really Space. cool name. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. he's a really <laughs> cool friend. Really he's cool a really name. cool guy, yeah. And he's a, he's a biker friend of mine and a okay. best friend of mine. He's a biologist. So you're a barber biker and he was a biologist biker. Right. And, uh, and we were drinking pitchers of margaritas at a Mexican place, and he came up with an idea, right? The idea was to take our motorcycles, save up the money that we needed to go on a, a road trip, and just leave. Just leave the place where we lived and just leave everything behind and just go. Oh, right? okay. And that was a drunken plan. <laughs> but we stuck to it, right? We stuck to the plan, and we decided... All right, yeah, like when we sobered up, we realized, yeah, it's a pretty good plan, let's do it. So we did, and we, we worked really hard for uh, a year and saved up all our dough, and we just, like, got tools, we got saddlebags, we got tent, we got, like, you know, every, all the gear we needed to go on a really long road trip. And we got contracts in Alaska to work on the fishing boats. He, he's a biologist, and every boat out there has, like, a biologist on their crew. And he had... Uh, connections, so he arranged a contract for me just to fish, just to pull and fish. So we had contracts, right, that cool. started in like five months from the, the point we left. In Florida. Right. So you had five months to get from Florida. We had five Florida months to get to Alaska. To Alaska. Right. To the Bering on Sea. On motorcycles. On motorcycles. So we had all that money saved and we just used the money to just travel and just party and just have a great adventure, right? And that's cool. What we did did you plan your route ahead of time? We did. We did. Just, okay. We did. Back then, it was like there was no GPS, right? So you had to get the AAA maps. Mm, right? Oh, man. And just yeah. like plan your route. And then we just like, you know, we had all our gear and, you know, we would marinate steaks during the day. And then when we get to our campsite at night, we'd like cook them. I think we used to bake potatoes in our engine blocks. Like you could wrap a potato <laughs> in a, an aluminum foil and you could, you could put it inside your engine block before you start your day of That's biking. That's brilliant. And six hours later, after riding on the road, you can you pull it out a and potato. It's, it's totally baked potato. <laughs> Dude. So we would just do you stuff learn. like that. And for me, it was a time to grieve, right? Because I just yeah. lost my mom and I just recovered from cancer. And it was like, we came to San Francisco where another best friend of ours was living here, my friend Frank, and he... Does uh, Frank have a cool last name? Frank Haynes. That's all right. First last name. <laughs> anyway, it's not space, yeah, It's not as cool as space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. I met someone in San Francisco, just to, just like hanging out with someone, right? Yeah, totally casual. A casual relationship, right? Yeah, just hanging totally. out. And then and, and, uh, I wanted to stay, and he had to go. He went on without me, and I, said, and, he, and I said, you know what, I'll just meet you in a few days, right? So I packed up all my stuff, put it on my bike, and I headed out, and I was out of San Francisco, and I was going through a toll, and this woman just sideswiped me, and she knocked me off my bike. I flew into the air, came down on the highway, and just rolled, and my bike was just gone, just trashed. No! Yeah. Destroyed my bike. I, wh what about you? And I had this shattered collarbone. I shattered my Woof. collarbone in six pieces, but that's what kept me in San Francisco. My and you couldn't do the contract and in I couldn't, Alaska, They, they obviously, won't let you like, work on the boats yeah, if you break anything. My friend Frank, his roommate moved out. Nice. And, uh, and I, I lived with my friend Frank, and I got a job at a place uh, here in the city. What did you do? I worked at a place called New Lab. It's like a photo lab. Okay. Right? It was before, like, digital. <laughs> it was like, yeah, this was... <laughs> like, there was still digital <laughs> photography, but, but photographers were still, like, bringing their stuff to labs back and then. And developing And developing film. them. And so I was... Yeah. That. So I got to kind of know San Francisco through photos. It was kind of cool. It was, like, through the fashion photography and the nature photography and all the photography, right? Because I was always working, and I was always just looking over these beautiful photos that all these big 
famous photographers would bring into the new lab, oh, very professional lab, fun. right? yeah. And so I worked with film all day and had insurance, right? So I could kind of like take care of myself and, and save some money and start nice. a life. So it was cool. And I, and I started to like fall in love with the city. And I, so city was beautiful. You got to look at all this film. Right. That's so, super cool. That's really cool. And when was, did you get to this building? That we're so I got, I got laid off. Film was becoming redundant, right? Mm -hmm. like, like that kind of film. Yeah. So people were getting laid off from their jobs doing that kind of work. Film processors and people <laughs> who work at Blockbuster Video. It was like, right. see you later, guys. Right. So I found a couple other different jobs. And how old are you in this? I am time 23. 23. Okay. Right. And I met someone who went to school here at the Circus Center. And I came by with them to see the school, and they introduced me to Master Lu Yi, the coach that has coached so many amazing artists, right? And I was introduced to him and he really kind of suddenly like took me under his wing, right? Like he started training me, moving me in this direction of hand balancing. Because he looks at the body type, you know, because I had really skinny legs and a, and a broad upper body, right? Uh -huh. And so he's like, I'm going to put you in handstands. I'm going to make you do chairs. Did he say that to you the first time you walked in the circus center? Kind like, of, yeah, yeah? The first week, yeah. And you were just like, okay. He could, well, he could see that I was really in love with the idea, the idea of learning circus and the idea of being here. I started training six hours a day for the next four years. Not on the weekends, but like about six hours a day. I was here every day, yeah. all day long, right? And from, the, from early in the morning till, you know, I could leave and then I'd have to go work. Yeah. Training really hard and... and, and, and Louis really, doesn't mess around either. He, does, he doesn't mess around. And, he, and from what I heard back then, it was... It was, in, it was pretty intense. It was a time. It was a pretty hardcore time. And people would train really hard here. And they <laughs> still do, but it was like, it was different back then a little bit. Because you had to really want it, right? There was no heat in the building. It was, it was really expensive to, to go to school here and live here. And What do you think made you really want it? I'm usually not the smartest guy in the room, right? But but I feel like I'm smarter with my body than I am with like ideas and ways to do things, right? So so I picked it up really fast. And I think it was maybe a year after I was here, I was approached by Jeff Raz, the guy who started the Clown Conservatory here. I guess someone had told him, check out this guy, Joel. He's kind of funny. He's got this kind of funny walk, <laughs> right? He's kind of funny. Okay. Check him out for the clown, this, this clown conservatory program you started. Okay. And so he did. He came to me and he asked me to audition, right? And so I auditioned. And he's like, I want you in this program. I want uh -huh. you to do it. And something clicked, right? Like I, I'd always kind of had funny bones, right? But I never really knew what they were, how they worked or what, well, how it worked at all, right? If you know what I'm, if that makes sense. You were always funny. <laughs> I, I kind of, always, I had this energy of someone who was like, had funny bones, right? Yeah. A class clown kind of. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, energy, yeah. I get right? that from you. And like when I am a clown, it is me when I was like 10 years old, right? A yeah. skinny, awkward, quirky, funny kid, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, so I, I do take that. But it's, that's debatable, yeah, right? How I'm, much of it is you and how much of it is not you, right? It's, it's, that's why clown's so complicated and, and crazy because it's taking these elements about yourself that you have, like a laugh or a smile or an expression or a movement that, and, and making them and, and working on those things to make, to make them bigger or more So you have to be pretty self-aware right? to be able to do it, huh? Yeah, it takes a lot of self-awareness. And it, and it, and but not why, a lot of self-consciousness. Right. <laughs> right. No, that's <laughs> which makes I think total is sense. what's tricky about clown, right? Is like you do have to be very aware of like who you are physically, right? Mentally, emotionally, but you also can't be so precious about all those things. Yeah, I would say that there's a there's a lot of things that you learn from uh, society, like how to act when you're with your boyfriend or girlfriend, how to act when you're at work. Yeah. How to act when you're with your parents. Yeah. How to act when you're in these certain social situations, right? But with clown, you learn to like just kind of let go of all those things. You really become who you are as a person. Mm. And, and you and you let if you let go of all those things that you've learned, you really become more open and and more expressive. Do you think anyone can be a clown? No. I don't, I don't think anyone can become a clown. Because not everybody has funny bones. I don't know. It's, it's, that's why it's magic, right? For me, it's like, it, it just seems like a magical thing. And right? you can't learn it. Well, I think you can learn techniques, and I think you can learn uh, concepts, and like what works and what doesn't, you know? Uh -huh. But I don't think anyone, hmm. I don't think everyone's born to be a clown. 
And I think that's what right. happened to me. I, I kind of like found what I was born to do. And when you when Great. you find the one thing that you're you were born to do, things start happening. And that's exactly what happened when I said yes. You and went to this clown conservatory. I went to the clown conservatory. And how long is the clown conservatory? It was for a year, and I was in there with amazing people. Right. I mean, I feel like the clown conservatory at that time just like the rest of the school just like birthed these amazing <laughs> talents who are sure. now so you went through the conservatory at the end of that year yeah. is it like do you graduate with an act do you graduate yes. with a character do you, how do, what does that look like for clown you graduate with an act usually it's they they were asking everyone to do duos but i really had this great idea that was a solo what was the idea? A solo idea. This I, this act that I still do a version of now in Palazzo because I'm I'm in Palazzo now and it's now it's developed into the, into this completely acrobatic clown number, right? It's this number where I'm reading a book. I'm reading under a lamp. I'm reading the book and then the light goes out. So the light goes out and I look at the lamp and when I look on the lamp, I I, I hit it to make it go back on and the lamp goes back on and I and I look at my I keep reading my book. And when I look at the book, the lamp goes off again. And then when I look at the lamp, it goes back on, right? <laughs> and I go, so it's really simple, Yeah. but it's like, it's, it's really funny, right? So it's this- I have a question for you about yeah, this. Sure. The, even the way you're speaking about it now, I'm so interested. <laughs> because, and I'll tell you why. I went to, so I'm a classically trained actor, I went, which is such a like, in my approach or the way I was trained initially was very much like inside out, right? right? Like you, thought about your character and why you were doing certain things. And I love the way that you're speaking about this because what you're talking about is not what the book meant or what state you were in, but you're just talking about movement. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's movement, but it's, it's just me sitting down reading a book, right? Like it's, it's, but are you actually reading the book? But I am. Like, is there a real book? Yeah. Do you read a different book every night? It's the, it's the, it's the same book. It's an encyclopedia. Oh. And I'm just and so, and I'll change the page sometimes, and I'll just read the book. Does your clown know why you're reading the book? Yeah, because I set it up in a way like in a different way each time. It depends on the show or the concept of the show. Okay. So in this show, I have a character in the show that's a bellhop. The concept of the show is it's an old hotel, like a CD kind of casino hotel on the on the street. Oh, is this Max's show? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's called yeah, it's called Fortune Hunter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's kind of like this hotel that used to have its heyday, and now it's kind of seedy, and it's owned by Mr. S. And he's going to lose the hotel, right? right? It's, it's come down on hard times. And, but I'm his little guy. I'm his sidekick, you know? Like I'm, I'm, his, I'm his number two. You know, I work really hard around the hotel, and I get into all these funny situations, you know, with, with clown work. And at one point, he's, he goes, take a break. So I kind of put this lamp down on stage. I put it down, and I, and I take this book, and I, that's how I start my number. And your right. clown likes to read encyclopedias. On break. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? The, the, I, I guess you should say there's as many different types of clowns as there are religions, right? Oh. And I think that, like, if you think of me as a clown, it's more of um, a character clown. This podcast is brought to you by The Artist Athlete. Did you know that The Artist Athlete is more than just a podcast? It's a growing online resource for students of the aerial arts to deepen their journey to badassery by accessing techniques approved by physical therapists and master coaches in the industry. Our current spotlight is on the Fundamentals of Aerial Alignment, a practical manual for hanging upside down. This online manual is a step-by-step -step guide. It is complete with photos, videos, and exercises that you can implement immediately to help you gain the strength and awareness you need for an aerial practice that promotes shoulder health and longevity and good posture upright so you don't walk around like a gorilla. But don't just take my word for it. Here's circus physical therapist, Dr. Jen Crane of Cirque Physio to tell you more. The Fundamentals of Aerial Alignment is an absolute must-have for every aerialist of every level. I can't even tell you how many shoulder injuries I treat that are a direct result of rushing past the basics and attempt to get a trick too soon. In the manual, Shannon deconstructs the fundamentals, including the correct muscular engagement to safely arrive in these positions and the rationale for why it matters. Of course, in addition to all of these fabulous pearls of wisdom, the book is also ridiculously fun to read. It's been lovingly garnished with the Shannon humor we all know and love. Thanks, Jen. 
Cirque Physio is also featured in the book to give scientific insight into why it all works. Pick up your copy today by going to theartistathlete.com and clicking e-manuals. Listeners of the podcast can get a 10% discount by typing in the offer code podcast at checkout. Again, that's theartistathlete.com, offer code podcast. Now, back to the show. What other types of clowns are there? Um, there are musical clowns, ones that play put acts around music, playing music, mm, okay. right? Dance, comedy, physical comedy through dance. There's... Do you think the Clown Conservatory in San Francisco produces more character clowns than any other type? I don't know. It depends on the person. Okay, so it's right? not on the training, but it's on the person. It's not in the training. It depends on the person just because mm. there's like every clown is different because everyone's different. But you have to apply a skill to your clown work. Dance, music, juggling, whatever the skill is, you have to apply that because you, you approach things as a personage, right, with, with your character. But like then and then, you know, you have to have something to wrap around it. So, so you graduated with... I, I, gra- I graduated with this act, right? And it was that act with the lamp. And then Gypsy Snyder mm-hmm. comes to San Francisco, mm-hmm. and she um, has auditions for the Pickle Circus. For those who don't know, the Pickle Circus is uh, San- was San Francisco's circus, right? Rich history in um, San Francisco, dating back to the 70s when Cirque du Soleil was starting, right? Was starting up with Guy and, and the only difference, I think, well, I mean, they were both in this, headed in this theatrical direction, but I think Cirque du Soleil got a tent and the Pickles never did. And But uh, Gypsy was back in San Francisco and her, it was before the Seven Fingers blew up. They had just finished workshopping Loft and or they were in the process of and she was in San Francisco to cast with, with Shana Carroll. Oh. They were here casting, and I auditioned with that piece. And uh, I got in it. I think after that, I was really headed in the kind of the direction that I am in now, right? That I've been consistent with, right? Just something modern, an idea that's modern, an idea that's uh, contemporary, right? Shows that, that follow that idea of um, what circus has become now, right? Can you define that a little bit more? Um, theater circus, more uh, a circus that's that is a is a combination of dance, theater, even film, music concepts that are more theatrical, right? As opposed to the more traditional route for circus, <laughs> right? Right. In the big tents, I'm not really big... interested in traditional circus. I, I oh, really why not? Like, I, well, you know, animals and things like I don't really. really You're not into like, it. I'm not into it, man. I'm not yeah. into the idea. But um, after working with Gypsy, I was really inspired, and I, I moved to Montreal, and I, and I tried to learn as much as I could. Cirque du Soleil had came to see Pickle Show, uh-huh. right? Michel Laprise. Back then, he was the head of casting for clowns at Cirque, and he came to see the Pickles, and, and he that said, if sense. you're in Montreal, look me up and, and come audition, right, for the Cirque. And so... Before I decided to move to Montreal, I gave him a call. I gave him, sent him an email and Michelle, and then he invited me to do a clown audition. So when I got there, I had a little, I had a time to workshop, and I did, and I worked in the street, and I and I paid the bills by street performing, and then when do I do you like street performing? I hate it. Okay. <laughs> I really don't like it at all. I don't know why. <laughs> I just don't like it. I don't, you know, and it. I so, like there the are stage. some people. I, I mean, like I theaters. was. I've been reading this book by Amanda Palmer, who is. She was the first I did a, person. I, to, I did a show with her. Do you know her? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. She used to have people do animation in her shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She talks about that. that. Yeah. But she wrote in the book. She writes about how she thinks every performer should be like a living statue or do mm-hmm. some street performing, mm-hmm. because it's this way of you kind gotta of. You got to try it interacting very organically with an audience that you have no control over. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Which it's... is also terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> because I feel like in a theater like they're on your turf, right. whereas in a street performing situation. No, it, I think it's important to yeah? do. I yeah. I think it's okay. important for, especially for a clown to do. Mm. I mean, that's where David Shiner got his start. Mm-hmm. A lot of our, you know, Renee Bassonet and all these amazing masters of clown, right? Yeah. Got their start in the street, you know, and, and you, you do learn a lot and you learn from other artists and you, I think it had its time, but I'm not. I You're not really, for it. I didn't enjoy it. Right on. Um, but. You went to audition. I went to audition and I was in this audition with 30 other clowns. And I think back then 
the auditions were different than they are now, I think, mm. at Cirque. Mm-hmm. Right? It was two days full of great exercises, right? All these theater games. And it came down to me and three other clowns mm. after two days, right? Everyone got cut, cut, cut. And so, yeah, so when there's four left, you make it into the database, right? <laughs> the golden database. The, the golden database. Yes. And then, uh, and then after that, it's a kind of a waiting game. And then you, you know, and then with clowns, it's really particular, right? So you have to wait till your till a role comes, and that did come, but not till two thousand eight. Ah. <laughs> what did you do in the meantime? Okay, so in the meantime, I lived in Montreal. I did some special projects with uh, with Cirque du Soleil back then. It was like 45 degrees. Yeah. It was called New Ventures. And New <laughs> Ventures. <laughs> New Ventures was uh, like, you know, where, you know, the corporate events, you know, the mm-hmm. special events yeah. and, and new ideas and shows. And I did um, some contracts for them. One was a, was a, a cruise ship project. It was really comfortable right it was it was really fun it was it was a, a kind of cushy gig you got guest status and it was it was nice yeah right? nice and uh that's why everyone else who worked on the ship the dancers hated us right yeah it was a fun gig and i did an eight month contract and then i did on a, the cruise ship on the cruise ship and then mm-hmm. i did another eight months on the cruise ship right um i forgot something that's fine okay cool what is it i got a story to tell you Okay. <laughs> You're going to like the story a lot. I'll All be right. the judge of that. Okay, cool. You can you can probably like dissect this. Interview uh, this is going to be like a two-parter. All right. So I was doing the run with the pickles, mm-hmm. right? Okay. And my father died. It was pretty devastating, right? So I think as a clown, I think these kind of things are the, are the things that like really develop who you are, right? If you identify as a clown, you identify as, as someone who works with emotions, right? A lot of funny people are, but mm-hmm. I, I'm always a you know I am what I am, right? Yeah, right? just right, like Robin Williams was, right? Yeah. Uh, so your dad died, and your so my dad died, and I think once you lose your parents, like both of them, I think it's some people say that like then you become who you really are. Do you think it's because you have no one to impress anymore, or no one to like? No, no one to like. You, then you then you. Or maybe that's more just me. <laughs> Well, I mean, I don't Connection have my much of a family, right? Like, mm-hmm. I have my parents. I'm, you know, I'm pretty on my own much of my life, right? So I felt alone, of course, right? Yeah, like, so totally. it's me and it's, and it's a career that I'm working really hard on and, mm-hmm. and to do. And I go to my dad's funeral and he leaves me a box. And in the box, there was a bow tie that he wore to my mom's funeral, right? A bow tie that he had when he got married to my mom, uh, like a watch, this watch that I still have, and a marriage certificate, like a marriage certificate, like a military marriage certificate from the 60s, like the early 60s, when he was in the Air Force in, in Germany. So he, apparently, like I read it, he's married to this woman in the early 60s before he met my mom. No one knew about this woman named Frida Vubaking. And I decided, like, I think he left it to me for a reason. And No uh, note or anything nope, with any of this? No note. Just no a note. marriage certificate. A marriage certificate, like, three pages long, right? A military one. Uh, very, like, detailed. Because marriage certificates back then, I guess, were really detailed in the military. Like, so I decided that if I ever got a chance to work in Germany, I would try and find her. In 2004, I got hired to work for the Seven Fingers in the show Loft in Berlin to take over their run that they were doing at the Chameleon, Mm -hmm. right? And so I decided when I was doing that run with Loft, I was gonna find her, right? And so I think it was uh, when I first got there, I was showing the certificate around to some other artists, right? Some other um, people who were in the city, these uh, Germans. I showed it to the the guy who was kind of our AD, was kind of our artistic director, who mm-hmm. took charge after the Seven Fingers had to leave. And on the marriage certificate, it said, Artiston, behind her name and all her family members, right? And her family, the family name was Trauber, right? And, and it said, uh, Artiston, uh, Trauber Trupa. Usually, it, and he was telling me that in, in Germany, if someone is 
an artist in, right? It's usually a performing artist and maybe on in a horse show or something like that. Okay. And I thought, is it possible that she was a circus? A circus performer. And so he did tell me that Trauber was a famous, like, circus family in Germany. I decided to, like, track her down. Olaf Triebel. And back then he was in the cast with me and he was doing the show with me. And, okay, uh, wait, hold on. Are you guys about to teach a class in here? Okay. okay. <laughs> we'll leave. <laughs> so so Olaf, when we last left our oh. hero. <laughs> <laughs> so Olaf Triebel um, mm-hmm. helped me find her, right? And because I didn't speak German. And he helped me find her by phone. And he found Frida. He found Frida Wubeking, right? And she wanted to meet me. And so I had to just uncover this mystery of who this woman was that my, my dad... Was she in Berlin? Married. Uh, no, she was in Frankfurt, Maine, where my dad was um, stationed in the military, in the Air Force, right? And that's where he met her. We had a week off for Christmas. Like, we had a week off of shows. And, um, and so I took a train to Frankfurt, Maine to go meet her. And she picked me up at the train station. It was snowing outside. It was in the middle of German winter, right? And she had on this big, like, white, like, rabbit fur coat, right? <laughs> it's one yeah. of those really, like, kind of like, there's like, you know. Yeah, like, like the like white an old witch from, queen. like, Narnia or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> She's looking <laughs> the old circus queen, you know, like this. Um, and she, and she, and she was, she smoked a ton, like a ton of cigarettes, and she drank really hard, and, and she, and she smelled like booze, too, a little bit, but she was pretty amazing and like yeah. pretty tough like she was an old tough circus chick right nice I could I could tell she took me back to her place where she lived with her sister uh-huh. and we barely could talk like we but what we we could understand each other she spoke some English but we um she had she told me that yeah she was married to my dad and um and she was a circus artist she was a wirewalker. What did she do? She was a wirewalker. She was a wirewalker and she was a juggler. And she did contortion. She did handstands, right? She was a she was an acrobat. And uh, it was amazing, right? To 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 know that my dad's first wife was a circus artist, right? <laughs> Pretty strange. I'm waiting for the part where like you are actually her child. Uh, right. Okay, so so Is what, that oh. what happened is okay. that like so I'm at her place. Uh-huh. And I look up on the wall. And I see this, uh, I thought it was a painting, right? But it was one of those weird, like, framed photos. It looks like a painting, right? Mm-hmm. But it's a photo. Like, mm-hmm. it's an old photo. <laughs> like, when they frame those old, like, photos. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The ones it, where you had to, like, sit really still yeah, in order yeah, totally. for them to, like, totally. process. But it looked just like me. It looked just like me, right? The photo, uh-huh. the photo painting, or whatever. And I went, who the hell is that right and she went that's my son that's Sam and I knew it was my half brother because my dad's name was Sam right and and they named him Sam and they and they had a, a son together like and he was much older than me you know he but he was at the age I was at when, when you was met taken. her yeah when I met her like yeah the photo the photo of him was like my age at that point so it looked just like me, and it looked just like my dad, and I looked just like my dad. And so she showed me all these amazing photos of, of her back in, from that time, and she had stacks of these beautiful old black and white circus photos of her walking on wire, and, 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 she's, and she said, this is the time when I was with your dad and married to your dad, and, and there was photos of him and her, and... It was beautiful. It was like it was pretty amazing, and it, and I and I had come there to t- also to tell her that he had died, right? Because uh, he, cause she didn't know. She didn't know he died. Okay. They hadn't been in touch since he left Germany. Okay. Right. And so I wanted to know why, you know, why yeah. they weren't still together, and what yeah. happened. And what she had told me was that they fell in love, and they were they were very much in love, and they had met when she was on tour. In a, in a military bar because ju- she would go and juggle at these bars these military bars mm-hmm. and do shows and he fell in love with her he saw her and, he, and she was she was beautiful then she you know she didn't look anything like she did back then at all right at this point <laughs> you know she I looked like she a never hard hears drinking this. smoker she looked like a hard drinking smoker but uh-huh, yeah. back then she was knockout and um and my dad and her fell in love 
and they lived together and they had a son together and I guess like my dad's parents loved her family and they were all really close right and no, my mom didn't and, and none of no one in my family knew anything about this at all right it was my dad's skeleton in the closet right and he, I guess he left me that certificate to find out all this stuff, right? And, and, so, and to meet my half-brother. But what ha- like, why did they not stay in touch? What happened was that he had to go back to the States. And he said, I'm going to get an apartment. And I'm going to fill it full of furniture and cozy things. And then I'll, I'll send for you. I'll get you a ticket. And I'll fly you to the States. And, you, and we can be together. And we'll just live, you know. But what happened, I guess, is that her mother got cancer and got really sick Mm. and she had to stay with her mom and it was a long process and she had to take care of her right she didn't have anyone else to take care of her but yeah sure like frida took care of her and so their love just kind of with time just fell you know through the cracks they just didn't stay together and this was like before you had email and texts and oh yeah getting on a plane to germany was not a big deal you know this was like back when that was an endeavor. Right. So, totally. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was, distance was hard. Right? Yeah. And so their love just fell apart, right? <laughs> and then, and it's kind of sad, yeah. And then what happened to Sam is that, I guess back then, Sam's job, like the way he made money for the family is that he would um, find guys that had these old cars for sale and he would like buy them and he'd fix them up and he would resell them, right? He'd flip cars, basically. Okay. And, uh, and so he was at this bar with this guy one night. He was drinking with this guy. And the guy said, I've got this old Cadillac for sale. If you want to come check it out. And he said, okay, cool. And he, and he drove with the guy to his house to check out the car. And the guy was really drunk. And uh, so he decided, you know, he, he checked out the car. He liked it. He said, you know, I'll come back for it tomorrow. And the guy's like, you know, he, let me drive you back to the bar. But the guy was really drunk. So he decided, I'm just going to take a cab. So they called for a cab, and Sam was waiting outside of the guy's house for the cab at night. And there's no street lights or whatever. Mm-hmm. And the cab comes to pick him up, comes around the corner, and doesn't see Sam, and kills him. Oh, hits no. Him, hits him and, and kills him oh. instantly, right? And so that's how Sam died. So, wh- of course, like, when they saw me, it was like this, like, it was this ghost that came back. At Christmas time, <laughs> to, you know, to like be with the family, right? Dude. So of course, like family gets together for Christmas. I'm there, and everyone's like, "Wow, Sam, it's you!" You know, and and, uh, and exactly how they remembered him, right? And so it was kind of creepy for a lot of people, right? And and I was in the middle of all of it, and um, and I'm surrounded by old retired acrobats, and and, and her father was a clown, and he was brilliant, and. That's an amazing. The, the trobbers, story. the trobbers are still going. Like, yeah, they still do wire walking, and you can you could Google it, you know, like you can check it out, and um, and so that's my new family. That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> and but, do you, are you still in, like do you go and see them when you go to Germany? And, you no, know, I wish I could say I did more often, but I you know I haven't in a long time. Yeah, and, and I'm I'm really not. You know, I should be more in touch, but I haven't stayed in touch. Like I'm, I, I haven't talked to them in a long time, and but I'm, I'm going to more often. You know, I, I, uh, you I, should. I, I, yeah, of course, right? Like, yeah. I know it's so easy to say. It's it's hard, right? Because uh, I don't have all the addresses. That's such a good the, story. The other family. <laughs> but the secret circus family. Yeah, totally. You had some inkling of it all along. And I just came back the show blown away and just like with, that and I recorded everything I filmed everything and I made like a documentary out of it oh so, yeah 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 so your life is so you did loft at the chameleon I did loft at the chameleon after that that's when I did that that's... the cruise ship gigs okay right? the two eight month contracts yeah right still waiting for Cirque du Soleil to call you yeah well I you know at that point I really wasn't waiting I was just kind of like yeah, doing yeah. my thing yeah and then I finished with that contract. And the funny thing happened, like, you're that long on a cruise ship and you're eating things for free. You never have to pay for anything, right? Like you, and I think it was like the first night I got off the cruise ship, I went into a restaurant, ordered this huge meal, and just walked out. <laughs> and they were like, hey, buddy, come back. You have to pay for that. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I was just on a cruise ship for like... You know, for two years. I'm sorry about that. 
<laughs> and so, so I got like acclimated back into society, <laughs> and I was in. San you Francisco. mean I have to pay rent now? <laughs> exactly. I'm not living in hotels. Someone my, doesn't just change pancakes. my sheets. I can't every- get pancakes and, and coffee delivered to me in the morning to my room. I can't get that. <laughs> this happens, I feel like, to a lot of performers who go on contract and right. then they just don't know how to live. <laughs> I'm so fascinated. Yeah, well, for me, it was like I would. it would make my world kind of small, right? Like I would mm. lose track of like what kind of music is is out what's what's everyone reading what's everyone listening to what's everyone doing you know it's like like being stuck in this you know you're doing the same show every night right so it's like you're you're stuck in this like rerun (laughs) (laughs) for like do you you think that's helpful for you creatively or do you think it's a i love it because i because i function really well with repetition and with like routine Mm -hmm. right i'm really good with a routine and i'm really good with um, making everything I do on stage look like the first time I've done it. So I think when you get good at that, you can really play with the magic that you create. What do you think that is? I think it's the desire to like create like a sense of wonder on stage, right? Yeah. I think that's the job of a clown. For me, it's to create a sense of wonder. To create like a really nice sense of wonder. Yeah. Right? And your numbers and, and what you're doing on stage, right? And like as you discover things and as you live in the world that you create in a show, I think that's important. Mm-hmm. And, and it makes you fresh. Yeah. Like if you can have that behind your eyes and you can have that energy, there's a role in no theater, right? In Japan. It's called No, right? And N-O-H. You're right. Yeah. And there's a guy who, his role is to see the sun. That's his only role in the show. And he sees the sun. And he's a master at that one thing. And he, and he comes out on stage and he sees the sun. And he, and he looks up at the sun and he feels that on his face. You're supposedly, when you see this guy do this role, you see the sun too, mm. right? Because mm-hmm. it's so convincing and so beautiful that he manifests this energy. And uh, so I think that's part of it. You know, how do you feel and what do you see and what do you create? Because you're working with emotions and you're working with your body and with an energy and you're working with all these different connections. You're connected to the to the music, to the people in front of you in 360, everything else. Right. There's all these different connections that you have to work as one moment. I think um, that's why a lot of great clowns are older. Right. Because that because it that takes a certain amount of time right it takes time and that's why they say clowns are like wine you know like it takes a long mm-hmm. time for things to get good and i think that's true i think it's like now that i'm in my 40s everything is cohesively done all those connections become instinct well i've been thinking a lot about this lately about this kind of metaphor that there's like this creative energy that's like running around us all the time it's like right. radio waves <laughs> and as artists or as instruments our job is to be able to tune into those radio waves right and i feel like as i get older and i'm you know 30 i think i'm 30 I'm 31 <laughs> um yeah. i feel like i'm like there's less or maybe my aluminum foil hat is getting like better <laughs> i don't know to like pick those things up sure, do you know sure, like sure. i wonder if it's like a matter of collecting experiences or like shedding other stuff we're made know. of experiences right and mm. we're made of like these these moments that sharp shape who we are and and you know, so you travel and you, and you lose things and you and you gain things and you, yeah. you know it, it, totally. you, so as life shapes you, you know you shape your life on stage and how you work on stage, right? So yeah, so they say acrobats reach their maturity in their mid twenties or late twenties, and then clowns reach their maturity much later, right? Mm-hmm. It's like a, it's like a, a point where you understand yeah. what you're doing on stage right? I've had this I've also had this kind of like reflection where it's such a shame that there's like this perception and I'm not sure how true it is and as acrobats get older and have demonstrated that they're capable of things a lot longer than yeah. ideas of that if acrobats can mature with age the way that other theatrical performers can and I think about this with dancers too older dancers who have all these experiences and can tap into this right. it's just such a shame that your body kind of doesn't sustain itself long enough to yeah. be the instrument that it could be in your early 20s when you don't have as much to say. Yeah, it's, it's, 
You can tell me if this makes sense. Okay. <laughs> but I feel like in dance... <laughs> no, I, I don't know if I'm quite dance, the person to make sense out of it. In dance, there's so much focus on technique, the actual dancing, right, of course, and, and then, like, you know, how to be a dancer, right? And there's not a lot of time left over to work on the self. It's like, yeah. it's all, you know, all these, like, things that you need to know as a dancer, right? But I think with a circus artist, you can take a lot of those things and, and focus on the self, right? Mm-hmm. And, and you need to use who you are. It's yeah. like a condensed version of acting, right? Where you have your five minutes to make things clear, but you, have, but you can't rely on tricks, right? Like you have to have who you are. Some people say that if you're boring in real life, you're probably boring on stage. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, yeah, so, I'll buy that. so circus is full of cool people. You know? Totally. It's full of people that like, you know, the, you find that like some of the coolest people are some of the, you know, who, are, who do circus or some of the best artists, right? Yeah, like, for there sure. There has to be that element too, you know? For sure. Like, <laughs> right? like circus is just right? cool. You don't have to be cool to dance. No. You don't have to be cool. No. But I think in circus, like, you can't. You know, you, there, it kind of helps, right? It kind of helps. It doesn't hurt. It, it, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> right? I don't know. I know, but but I'll say that, like, I mean. Right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, if you want to hear me get Joel back on track, hear the story of how he met his wife, which is really cool. Uh, how he got the call for Cirque, and his amazing advice to himself and other circus artists, you'll have to tune in next week. Or if you can't wait and you want to hear the entire uncut interview, there's a ton of details and things that, for time reasons, I had to leave out. But they're really cool, too. So if you want to hear all that, you can do so by becoming a Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash theartistathlete. In the meantime, you can find Joel on the interwebs. Uh, via his website, joelbakerclown.com. You can witness him in all his clown-like bellhop glory on Instagram at joelbakercircusartist. Or if you're in Berlin, you can just go see him at Fortune Hunter at the Palazzo all winter long. If you want to see me in person, I will be doing a mini tour of the Pacific Northwest um, starting in November, late November, with stops in Ashland and Portland, Oregon. And I will be in Seattle, Washington from December 3rd to December 18th, including at the Apogee Aerial Arts Festival. And you can go to apogeearialdancefest.com to find out more about that. If you're not in that area but want to get in touch with me anyway please do. My website is www.theartistathlete.com. And for aerial related training tips and inspiration, you can find me on Instagram at the underscore artist underscore athlete. Talk at you next week, friends, fans, and enemies. The Artist Athlete Podcast is supported solely by donations from people like you. Here's what some of those people have to say. Hey there, friends, fans, and enemies. This is Chris Alston, Patreon of the Artist Athlete Podcast. Straps artist and Lyra performer and acrobat out of Greenville, South Carolina. So if you're ever passing through, make sure to stop in and see me and my friends. We have a wonderful space and we'd love to see you. Hi, my name is Erica Lee. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and I'm an aerialist. I teach performing arts to elementary school during the day and do pole and slings and rope by night. I really, really like the Artist Athlete podcast because it gives me a lot of circus goals to look forward to. It gives me a lot of insight on what's going on around the world in circus. And um, that's why I'm Patreon.